Welcome to the uh, Global Heritage, Chapter 13, The Early Middle Ages. The art of these Germanic tribes was dramatically different from that of Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines. They were migratory people organized in warlike bands, not wealthy, aristocratic, living in cities. Instead of temples to the gods, the Germanic princes built large wood halls where they would feast and drink with their comrades. I think something important to interject right here is that um, these tribes coming in and overtaking large parts of Europe were, were, <laughs> these people were often welcomed by your average Roman because things were violent in, uh, and, and, and things have gotten really bad in the Roman Empire. Um, uh, war was going on, pestilence, things weren't good. Um, the economic situation was horrendous for uh, people of average income or poor people. So when things get really, really bad and, you know, you're worried about food and, and, and whatever, the idea of being invaded and taken over and things changing might not be seen as a bad thing. So I thought I would interject that. The art of the Angles and Saxons, like other Germanic tribes, did not depict the human figure at all. It was a decorative art of small, intricately patterned golden and jewel objects. The Germans were great metal workers and wonderful weapon makers. They also used their skills to create elaborate jewelry. For the warrior, aristocracy, such treasure was both symbolic of their great statue and prize for its own sake. The great Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf tells us of the love for bright colors and precious metals, materials that gleamed and flowed. Such treasure had almost magical fascination for them. Heroes like Beowulf wore rich golden buckles on their costumes and were buried with these ornaments as part of a pagan ritual. In 1930, the remains of an entire 7th century Anglo-Saxon warship was found buried in England at a place called Sutton Who. The measures unearthed there included an elaborate golden buckle about five inches long whose intricate patterning seems incongruous with its barbarian source. Three plain gold circles were interlaced with a fine web of serpents. The interwoven animals, especially serpents, is typical of the Germanic style. So you have to remember these people are nomadic and that's what leads them to have artwork um, that they could travel with. Although Rome has ceased to be the center of the empire, it remained the center of the Christian church in the West. In 597, missionaries were sent by the Pope to England to convert the heathen Anglo-Saxons. The conversion of the English to Christianity began a rich period of artistic production, especially the illustration of manuscripts. Book illustration had not been very important artistic medium in the Roman world, but because the Christian New Testament was so central in new faith, the decorations of the Gospels became worthy of the greatest efforts. Elaborately decorated manuscripts were prepared in monasteries where monks devoted their lives to the glorification of God. Now, when I look at this, how um, there were pagans in the British Isles, and Christianity went to overtake them. This is important because the remnants of this happening is important to our culture even today. So Easter is a Christian holiday. And yet we have Easter bunnies. Where do these Easter bunnies come from? Where do the Easter eggs come from? Well, the fact is the Christian church in order to convert these pagans and keep them converted, put Christian holidays on top of pagan ones so that when the pagan holidays came up, these people wouldn't go back to their old ways. So the idea of an Easter bunny and an egg are fertility symbols that come from uh, April, when the pagans would have their fertility rituals. The same could be said for Christmas. We have Christmas, the birth of Christ, but 
why do we have a Christmas tree? Where does that come from? It is actually a celebration of the winter solstice that was celebrated by the pagans. And so we get some of that imagery that trickles over even into uh, Christian um, holidays. So, um, let's move on. Lindisfarne, or Holy Island, on the English coast, was on the earliest sites of an especially fruitful mingling of earlier Irish or Celtic traditions, the Anglo-Saxon artistic style, and the Roman Byzantine. Two pages from the same go book of Gospels, the book of Lindisfarne, of about 700, illustrate the dramatically different artistic styles being practiced at the time of the edge of what had once been the Roman world. In the page with instrument ornamental cross, we can immediately recognize the same interlaced decorative pattern of lines that the Anglo-Saxons used in their metalworking, in this case, twisting dog-headed serpent and wild birds. In the page with the ornamental cross, we can immediately recognize the same interlaced decorative pattern of lines that the Anglo-Saxons used in their metalworking, in this case, twisting dog-headed serpent and wild birds. Here, however, the formerly pagan design is superimposed with the shape of a cross, the most powerful symbol shape in Christian art. The original of this artwork is only a little larger than 9 by 12 inches. Think how different this was from the human scale of Greek art or the superhuman scale of Roman architecture. In the same book, however, we find pictures of another type. These are portraits of the four evangelists or authors of the four Gospels. While the border surrounding St. Matthew matches the style of the cross page, the rest is typical of a surprisingly different style. It shows the figure of the saint sitting on a bench, writing his Gospel about the life of Christ. Above him is an angel. The northern tribes had no tradition of human portraiture, so what was the source of this image? Historians suspect that visiting monks from the Mediterranean world brought to Linda's farm a gospel book or books in the Byzantine style. Notice the similarities between the figure of St. Matthew and the mosaics of Christ as the Good Shepherd. Although the medium and the ties are completely different, the sharp lines of the drapery and the long, thin body certainly resemble each other. The drawing is stiff and awkward, more of a collection of pairs than natural forms. This is partly because the artist is copying from another source, a source he considers sacred, but does not really understand, never having drawn a human figure from life. During the, middle, during the early medieval period, Monastic artists, like philosophers and theologians, accepted the authority of the past. Christian monasteries attempted to preserve what was left of Roman culture by copying classical manuscripts as well as Christian works. This kind of copying from sacred texts, rather than working from nature, was the rule. Thank you, and that's the end of this lecture.